I said, praise the Lord. I welcome you to a new month. And I pray that something new will happen in every life in Jesus' name. New anointing. New power. New authority. New progress. New success. And all the good desires of your heart, the Lord will fulfill anew in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for the workers meeting today. Thank you for the training you are giving us every time. And we thank you for the result. Thank you for the outcome. Thank you for the evidence of growth in every one of our lives. We're asking, O oh Lord, that tonight you speak to us again and your word will have impact in every life in Jesus' name. We pray that something new, something great, something majestic will happen in every life and every ministry in Jesus' name. This year, Lord, 2020, every month will see us moving forward every time in Jesus' name. Be glorified in every life tonight and give us the heart to learn, the spirit to receive, and the attitude to totally take everything in the word and benefit from the word in Jesus' name. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And the revived workers said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. Can see now we're coming to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19. I'm reading from verse 5 and verse 6. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 19, verse 5. And said, For this cause, Shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh? What therefore, what wherefore, they are no more twain, but one flesh? What therefore God has joined together? Let not man put asunder. I'm sure you're familiar with those verses I've read, but I'm not talking on marriage. I'm talking on something very important. And you need those two words there in verse 5. The word leave and the word cleave. You see, there are many people, they want to see something new in their lives. They want to see something new in their ministry. They want to see something new in their environment, in their approach. The problem with them is they do not understand the difference between the old and the new. They're still cleaving to the old and they want something new. They want to see something new, new power and new anointing, new progress and new authority. That's what they want to see while they're holding on tenaciously to the old. But the Lord is telling us something today. If you're going to see the new, if you're going to experience the new, if you're going to possess the new, if the new things we'll be talking about is going to take effect in your life, you must let go of the old. You must leave the old. You must separate from the old and then come to the new. Tonight we're looking at the message, leaving the old and cleaving to the new master. Leaving the old and cleaving to the new master. That's the challenge the Lord is giving to us. A new year has come. And a new perspective has come. And a new desire has come. And the Lord wants to grant us the new prospects. But then we must leave the old behind. We must separate from the old. And it is in that leaving the old and cleaving to the new that we are going to have the expectation that we are expecting. Expectation in your life will not be cut off. 
expectation in my life will not be cut off. Remember the message today, leaving the old and cleaving to the new master. I'm looking at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 11. Acts of the Apostles. We're looking at chapter 11, and we're reading from verse 23. Leaving the old and cleaving to the new master. In Acts chapter 11, verse 23, who oh, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all that to a purpose of heart they were cleave unto the Lord. That with purpose of heart they will cleave unto the Lord. You see here, this man of God came to Antioch. And as he saw the people, he saw the grace of God in them. And he saw the goodness of God in them. And he saw that they were really born again. They were real converts and they were real children of God. And the grace of God manifested in them to live the new life. Now he said to them, you know what? You need something. If this new life is going to bloom, is this good new life is going to shine forth. If this new life is going to take root and take effect, you must, with purpose of heart, with a real decision, make sure that you leave the old behind and you leave the old forever. Turn your back on the old and keep and cleave unto the Lord your new master. And then we're told in verse 24, For he was a good man, and full of the Holy Ghost, and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. This year, I'm believing, you are believing, we're believing, we're going to have fruit. Abiding fruit. Abundant fruit. Abounding fruit in Jesus' name. Many people were added unto the Lord. You know why? Because he himself, Counseling the people, admonishing the people, preaching unto the people. He had purpose of heart to cleave to the new master. And you see, marriage was the master. It's not a fruitless marriage. When you are married to the Lord, when you cleave to the Lord, when you refuse to think of the old and you are only for the new, you are going to discover there will be fruit in your life. There will be fruit in my life. I said there will be fruit in my life. I said there will be fruit in my life. I can't hear my people. There will be fruit in my life. There will be fruit in your life in Jesus' name. Look at Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 9. Romans chapter 12, verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. That's the word cleave again. But you see, before you say cleave to that which is good, he said, Abhor that which is evil. Abhor, avoid, reject, push away, separate from. Leave that which is evil and cleave to that which is good. If we can bring in the illustration of marriage. Before marriage, many people, whether they are men or women, they have had acquaintances. They have had fellowships. They have had associations. They have had friends. And eventually, if they are Christians, the Lord leads them that this is the person they are going to marry. And he understands by that, and she understands by that, this is the one I'm going to cleave to. And then that person becomes a special person. He becomes a person that is set apart for this new relationship. And as they get married, there's something he has to do. There's something she has to do. The friends of the past, they cannot be as friendly. They are not enemies, but she keeps them in their place. She leaves them to cleave to the husband. He leaves them to cleave to the wife. And so it's like you avoid that. You separate from that. You jettison that. 
you keep that one at a distance that you will now completely, entirely, wholeheartedly cleave unto your spouse, unto your partner, unto your companion, abhor that which is evil and cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affection one to another with brotherly love in honor preferring one another. If we're going to make progress in our Christian life, if we're going to see the realization of all that God has been speaking to us about in this new year, we'll leave the old and we'll cleave to the new master. Three things we're looking at. Number one, the pattern and the poverty of the old man. The pattern and the poverty of the old man. You come into the faith. You come into the grace of God. You come to the kingdom of God. And if your kingdom citizenship is going to bear any fruit, there's something, there's something. The old man, with all the implications of the old man, you leave, you abandon, you abstain from, you kick away you put at a far distance not to come back to you again because if you continue with the old nature and with the old man and you continue in that pattern there's going to be poverty here on earth and poverty in the great beyond the pattern and poverty of the old man number two the priority of purity with our new master our new master, this is what he desires. And this is what he compels us to have. And this is what he has provided. Purity that becomes number one in our lives. As we work with the master, as we work for the master, as we wait on the master, as we lean on the master, as we depend on the master, as we rely on the master, as we enjoy fellowship with our new master, the number one thing that will be in our life is purity, the priority of purity with our new master. Point number three, the personality and the profitability of a new minister, a new creature, a new Christian, a new man, a new minister, a new witness, a new watchman, a new workman, a new person, totally new. And it's uh, God, the grace of God, a new grace that he never had before, a new faith that he never had before, a new dependence upon the Lord he never had before, is a new minister. Look at his personality, and we're also going to look at his profitability, the personality and the pro profitability of a new minister. Number one, tell me number one over there, somebody. Tell me as if you're ready to learn. The pattern and the poverty of the old man. We're coming to Deuteronomy chapter 12. Deuteronomy chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 8 and verse 9. Deuteronomy chapter 12. We're reading from verse 8. Ye shall not do after all the things that we do here this day. Every man whatsoever is right in his own eyes. For ye are not yet come to the rest and to the inheritance which the Lord your God giveth you. As you look at those two verses, verses 8 and 9 of Deuteronomy chapter 12, uh, the man of God, Moses, was looking at the lives of the children of Israel. He said, there is a way of life in the wilderness. A way of life in the jungle. 
But then there's another way of life when you come to your inheritance, when you come to the land of promise, to the land of Canaan, when you come to the land flowing with milk and honey, when you come to a settled life, when you come to the promised life, when you come to everything the Lord had promised that you are going to achieve, you are going to inherit, he said, the old life, the wilderness life, the jungle life, the unsettled life, he said, you will not continue like that. Ye shall not do at all the things that we do here this day. He said, look at everyone and look at what they do. Look at how they act. Look at how they behave. And look at the things, even though they act the law, the law had been given to them. Even though they profess to be saved and redeemed, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Even though they had leaders among them to say, go this way, go that way, yet it said they were not listening. And they were not doing according to the will of God. Every man was doing whatsoever seemed right in his own eyes. He said, the reason is because you are not yet come to that rest. You are not yet come to the inheritance which the Lord your God giveth you. You know what was saying? When you get to that land, there must be something new. There must be something different. All the things you do as if you are lawless, as if there's no law, and you are leaderless, as if there's no leader, and you are lost as if you cannot find your way, and everyone is an independent um, citizen. Everyone is an independent uh, Israelite. It said, that's the old life. Leave that. You're coming to the new, and when you come to the new, and you come to your inheritance, there is something totally different. In our lives, in this new year, there's something totally different. Attitude, different. Conversation, different. Lifestyle, different. Family life, different. Everything will be different in Jesus' name. It, it tells us something there. That if you do whatsoever is right in your eyes, whatsoever is all right in your own sight, and you act against the law, without the law, contrary to the law, it says, you have not entered into the rest provided for you. You have not entered into the inheritance provided for you. It's like, uh, you know, having jungle existence, jungle life, wilderness life. But the rest which the Lord has provided, you have not got yet. Second Kings chapter 17. In 2 Kings chapter 17, look at verse 34. 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 34. Unto this day, they do after the former manners. You see that? They didn't leave the old. How many people have come to this new year? As a Christian, as a family man, as a family woman, as a leader, as a minister, as a member of a church like this, and it was spoken about the 2020 covenant and the 2020 commandment and the 2020 compensation and the 2020 confirmation of the promise of God. We've heard that, and yet there are some people, their lives are still like the old life and the old behavior and the old character. Unto this day, they do after their former manners. Can you tell, can you tell me of families who have seen this new year as they were fighting the previous year? They're still fighting. And can you tell me of members of the church as they were shallow in the previous year? They said they are not deeper. They're still shallow. 
Can you tell me your people in the previous years, they were carnal, they were not new creatures, and this new year, they're still carnal. They're missing out in life, and they're missing something. You're missing the possibility of the new fulfillment of the great word of God in your life. In verse 34, unto this day, even though it's a new year, unto this day, even though it's a new month, unto this day, they do after their former manners. They fear not the Lord. They do whatsoever is right in their eyes. Neither do they, do they after their statutes or after their ordinances or after the law and the commandment which the Lord commanded the children of Jacob whom he named Israel. Let's look at verse 40. Verse 40 says, How be it? They did not hack him. We shout, New Year has come. How be it? They did not hack him. We say, New promises are given unto us, and new prospects before us, and the new project before us. Let's address ourselves to it. How be it? They did not hack him. We say, The promises of God are fresh, the promises of God are new. And this year, all the promises we have been reading, we've never, we've never experienced them, enjoyed them. We're going to enjoy them. How be it? They did not hack him. We're saying that when we come to know the Lord, we become new creatures and new Christians and new covenant people. How be it? They did not hack him, but they did after their former manner. They did after their former manner. You are wondering, but why? How could somebody hear the word over and over, and instead of leaving the old and coming to the new master, is still like it was, ever like it was, still speaking like he used to speak, and still thinking like he used to think, and still striving you know, as he used to strive, and still going the left, a leftist, as he used to do. Look at uh, Jeremiah chapter 13. I'm reading from verse 23. Jeremiah chapter 13, verse 23. Can the Ethiopian change his skin? Even though he moves from the old year to the new year, can the Ethiopian change his skin? Even if he moves from, con from congregation to congregation, can the Ethiopian change his skin? Even if he hears a message now and another message again of the leopard sports, then may he also do good who are accustomed to do evil accustomed to do evil. You know, sometimes we we'll hear the painful story, the terrible story of a woman who has married a man and yet has not left the old man, the old friend, the old acquaintance, and there'll be problem in that marriage. Sometimes we we'll hear of a man was married a woman, and he, the man, has not left the old girlfriend, and the old lady friend, and the old same partner, and the old personality. There will be a problem in that marriage. And when you come to the Lord, and we're hearing stories, and we're seeing evidence, you have not left the old master. You have not led the old commander. You have not led the old leader. You have not led the old nature. There will be a problem in such an individual. You know why such people cannot move on to the new? They are accustomed to doing evil. And they do not take a decision and kneel down and pray, and repent, and make a definite covenant of the Lord. Lord, this is what I had been, and this is what I've been doing, and I know that this is just whatsoever is right in my eyes. I now want to come into the land of promise. I want to come into your kingdom. I leave the old in a very definite statement of repentance, and I receive Jesus Christ as my Messiah, I receive Jesus Christ as the Master. I receive Jesus Christ as my Savior. 
I receive Jesus Christ as my commander and my leader to lead me on. Lord, with your grace, remove the old life. Remove all the things that were old in my life and make me a new creature in Christ. That is what turns us on to become new creatures in Christ. I'm looking at Jeremiah chapter 4. Jeremiah chapter 4, and I'm reading from verse 22. Jeremiah chapter 24, verse 22. Chapter 4, chapter 4, verse 22. For my people is foolish. My people, foolish. My people, they profess to be my people, foolish. They see marriages all around them. And they see that for a marriage to succeed and for a marriage to really be marriage, that they have to leave the old and they have to cleave to the new. But my people is foolish. They say they are following me. They say they are worshipping me. They say they want to spend eternity with me in heaven. And yet they remain with the old. And they are not leaving the old. For my people is foolish. They have not known me. They are sorty children. And they have, they have none understanding. They are wise to do evil. They are wise to do evil. They have always been doing evil. They are accustomed to doing evil. And they are not leaving the evil of the past. They are wise to do evil, but to do good, they have no knowledge. We are coming to Hosea chapter 4. Hosea chapter 4. We are reading from verse 6. Hosea chapter 4. And we're reading from verse 6. The Lord is saying, if you cleave to the old, if you embrace the old, if you stay with the old, if you keep on doing what you have always done, you will be what you have always been. The old brings failure. The old is referred to as fornication. The old is referred to as adultery. If you cleave to the old, if you remain with the old, and you are just using the name of the man, the name of the woman, to cover yourself, I am married. Uh -huh. You are married, but you are still cleaving to the old. You are still abiding in the old. You are just using that word marriage as camouflage, as cover up. But if you keep on doing what you've always done, you will receive what you've always received. Look at Hosea chapter 4, and I'm reading from verse 6. Hosea chapter 4, we're reading from verse 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. You have rejected the knowledge that when you come to the kingdom and you are married and now totally given to the new master, to the Messiah, that you will totally reject the old. But if you reject that, one leg inside there, one leg outside there, because you have rejected the knowledge, I also will reject thee that Thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God. I also will forget thy children. I pray God will give us understanding. I pray God will give me understanding. He'll give you understanding in Jesus' name. Look at chapter 8 of Hosea. Hosea chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 1. Set the trumpet to thy mouth. You see, when we preach, we don't cover our mouths in preaching. You set a trumpet to thy mouth. And there are some people, and they, they are preaching and they are thinking, I hope uh, nobody is offended. I hope nobody is convicted. I hope nobody is uh, um, unhappy. I hope, uh, you know, I'm still popular. I hope, uh, you know, what I'm saying to the people. 
that, that's the old preacher. They are not thinking of what God has said. They are not thinking of what God has told them, go and tell my people this. They are not thinking of what will take the people to heaven. They are thinking of, are they happy with me? Am I popular with them? Or are they unhappy? Am I going to get into trouble with anybody if I preach the word of God like this? Set a trumpet to thy mouth and preach the word without fear and without favor. What was he to tell the children of Israel? It shall come as an eagle against the house of the Lord because they have transgressed my covenant and trespassed against my law. How about that? What happened? Look at uh, verse uh, 2. Israel shall cry unto me, My God, we know thee. Israel cried to the Lord, saying, We know thee. We're married to you. We're giving to you. We are abandoned to you. We have a covenant with you. Look at verse 3. Israel has cast off the sin that is good. The law of God, they cast that off. But you are our God. The word of God, they toss that has said, but you are our God. We always come to worship you, and you're the only one we worship, but they cast the word of God aside. We're always praying, and we're looking up to you, that you are the one to provide everything we need, and they cast the word of God aside. Look at that. Look at that. They were still the same old people. It says Israel has cast off the sin that is good. The enemy shall pursue him. That's what I said. If you keep doing what you've always done, you will keep experiencing what you've always experienced. Defeat was in their trail. And a new year came. And a new situation came, and instead of turning over and living according to their covenant of the new year with the new master, they kept on doing the same thing. If they hear the word on character, on commitment, on consecration, on holiness, on righteousness, on purity, they cast that one aside. They're waiting for only healing and deliverance and prosperity and success. That's the old life. The old life. Give me, give me, give me. And then they're not giving their hearts unto the Lord. You separate from the old life to come to the new life. Look at verse 12. Look at verse 12 here of uh, Osea chapter 8. Osea chapter 8 verse 12. I have written to him the great things of my Lord. I have written to him. I'm saying come to a new relationship. And if you're going to come to a new relationship, there is something that will join us together. There's something that will tie us together. That is something that will keep us together. The great things of my law. I have reached to him the great things of my law, but they were counted as a strange thing. Isn't that the whole life? They were not living the old, and they did not have any. They did not have any relish, any likeness for new things, for the new words of God. I pray we will not be like that. I pray I will not be like that. Our church will not be like that in Jesus' name. Uh, look at look at this in Acts chapter seven. Acts chapter seven, the pattern and the poverty of. The old man, old ways of life, old way of thinking, old way of living, old way of doing virtually everything. New Year has come, it's still the old life. It's still the old attitude. It's still the old dispensation. Acts chapter 7, verse 51. You steep neck and uncircumcising heart and ears. Ye do always, notice that word, always, underline that word, always, take note of that word. Ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. As your fathers did, so do ye. What will that mean? What it means is this. 
when their fathers were alive, their fathers resisted the Holy Ghost, rejected the Word of God. And before their fathers died, their fathers told them, this is what the Holy Ghost has said all through our lifetime. But this is what we have done, contrary, against the Holy Ghost. Now we're leaving, and you are taking our place, do as we have done, so that the trench of rebellion, and the trench of stubbornness, and the trench of disobedience will continue. Don't let it break. As we have resisted the Holy Ghost, you also resist the Holy Ghost. Well, let's complete the sentence. If you do the evil that your fathers and your leaders have done, you will go to the same place your evil fathers and evil leaders have gone. If you reject the truth, if you abandon the truth, if you live like the old fathers in their rebellion, you will end up in the same hell that the old fathers went to. You stiff necks and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept them. You see, the life they lived, they manifested the old, the nature, and the character, and the characteristics of the old man. What are the characteristics of the old man? Number one, old habits. The days are different. The year has turned around. A new year has come, but it's the old habits. Number two, old heedlessness. Heedlessness. They never took heed to the word of God. December went, January has come. The old year went, the new year has come. They still will not heed the word of God. It's the old nature. It's the old life. And that pattern of life that sticks to the old habits, old heedlessness, old Head in the sand. What does that mean? Instead of seeing the truth, I don't want to see that. They put their head in the sand. They bury their head in the sand. That's always what they have done. When you're speaking the truth, that will convict them and lead them to confession and lead them to conversion, they will go asleep. They close their eyes. They sleep literally. They go to sleep because they have the old head in the sand attitude. They stick their head in the sand. They don't want to hear. They don't want to see. Number four, old hypocrisy. There are people in the past life, in the old life, what made them the old man is hypocrisy. Always hypocritical. Always pretending. And the new year has come and it's still the old hypocrisy. Old hardness. Old hardness. They hear the word of God. They have a way. They have developed a way of hardening their heart of uh, stopping their ears, of closing their eyes, they are not going to hear old hardness, old history, hurry, old history, hurry. They never finish any project. They never finish any assignment. They never finish any duty. Haste and hurry, haste and hurry. They're doing this now. They've not finished. They've not br brought it to conclusion. They jump on another scene. And they will not finish that. They jump on another scene. That's what caused the poverty of the old life. In the old time, 
stay with what you have and abandon this old hate and hurry. Number seven, old hesitation. Old hesitation. There's an assignment to take up. There's a duty to take up. There's a responsibility to take up. But there's the old hesitation. They're looking at it. Do I want to? Do I want to do that? Do I want to listen to that? Do I want to accept that? They're hesitating until another person will come and take that opportunity and they have lost it forever. Number eight is old harshness. Old harshness. They are harsh every time. And even when you have not offended them and you're smiling and you're loving and you're embracing and you're saying, come, my friend, what next are we going to do? You're surprised what comes out of them. Harshness. But why? Well, I don't understand. That's the way I've always been. That's what the Lord is telling us. If you keep on doing what you've always done, how many people have you lost as friends? How many converts have you lost? How many brethren have you lost? How many people do not want to come near your house anymore because of the old harshness? And you've lost a lot already. And if you go on like that, it's going to be the same old story. Old harshness. Old hollowness. They're hollow. They don't have any value. They don't have any weight. Their words are not weighty. The example is not witchy, and it's like a hollow tree. The tree is there, and the tree appears all right from the outside, but inside is hollow. All those termites are eating up the various uh, nutrients and the sap inside the tree. Old hollowness, and yet, as hollow as they are, they have the old high-mindedness. Old high-mindedness. And that's uh, number 11 now. Old high-handedness. The way they handle things and the way they handle people. High-handed. High-handed. And when, you know, he's coming, so and so he's coming, what's he going to say now? And then he comes, and true to his nature, old nature, old man, high-handed. And then there is the nature of the old heart and hand. Heart and hand. Just takes delight in hurting people. Just happy. And when people are healthy, and when people are happy, and when people are moving forward, it's not happy with that. Why are they happy? Why are they rejoicing? Why are they smiling? He must find something that will hurt and harm his brother or his sister without any provocation. It's the old life. I pray God will take the old life away from every one of us. I say God will take the old life from every one of us. I'm going to ask you a question this new year. What has become new in your life? Your habit? Any new thing? Are you heed the word of God? Any new thing? Head in the sand? Are you sincere this year? Hypocritical? Are you honest this year? Hardness of heart? Are you softened this year? Haste and hurry? Haste and hurry? Are you slow and steady this new year? Hesitation. Do you jump at the opportunity? Let me have that. Old harshness, old hollowness, old high-mindedness. Are you humble this year? Are you lowly this year? Old handedness, old high-handedness. Do you realize that that's a human being? Do you realize that that's a child of God? Do you realize that that person has flesh and blood? Do you realize that you can feel pain? And have you gone away from the old high-handedness and then from the old hurry and harm? What do you want to be remembered for? So and so is gone. Oh, I remember. God help him. And God have mercy on him. We're not happy he's gone, but you know what? It's always finding somebody to hurt and somebody to harm. 
Any time is anywhere, he must hurt somebody. I hear he's gone. God have mercy on him. I hear she's gone. God have mercy on her. Because she could never separate herself from that old hurt and harm attitude. The pattern and the poverty of the old man. We're looking at a first Corinthians chapter five. First Corinthians chapter five. I'm reading from verse seven. First Corinthians chapter five. And here we're reading from verse seven. In verse seven, put out therefore the old leaven. Put it out. Put it out. Leave it. Leave it alone. Don't touch it. Don't go near that scene again. But out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lamb, as ye are unleavened. For even Christ our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Point number two now, the priority of purity with our new master. Our new master, that's the Lord Jesus Christ, the number one thing on his list, why he came to die for us, why he atoned for our sins, why he's granting us forgiveness, why he gives us grace, is so that he will cleanse us from the old life. He will purge us from the old life. He will purify us from the old life. And our lives will remain pure all the time. That's his priority. Any other sin, if you abandon purity, any other sin is worthless. If you abandon holiness, any other sin is worthless. If you say, I'm busy, I'm busy with this or that, and you do not have the mind of Christ and the holiness and the purity it was, and it takes as, as priority. Every other sin is useless in his sight. That's what we're told in Psalm 51. Psalm 51. I'm reading here from verse 6. Psalm 51 verse 6, Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. That's the priority of the Lord. Truth in the inward parts. You're, you're transparent. You're a real child of God. You say there's nothing to, there's nothing I gain by being untrue, by being dishonest, by covering up anything. After all, God desires truth in the inward part and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom wisdom if there's purity there that's of god wisdom so called if there's hypocrisy there that's of the devil wisdom so called if there is uncleanness there that is of the devil. Wisdom so-called, if there's covering up of the truth, that's of the devil. And those who buy that wisdom, and those who trade in that wisdom, the wisdom of the devil, they will spend eternity with the devil in hellfire. It says in the Eden part, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with Aesop. And I shall be clean. That's the priority prayer. That's the prayer everyone ought to make as number one before we pray for any other thing. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Wash me, not the way I can wash myself. Wash me, not the way psychology can wash me. Wash me, not the way morally so. Wash me, wash me yourself. And I will be white. In fact, I'll be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins. Blot out all mine iniquities creating me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit 
within me, renew a right attitude within me, renew, build up a new habit in me, renew a right spirit within me, cast me not away from thy presence, take not thy Holy Spirit from me, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, uphold me with thy free spirit, then will I teach. Then will I teach. If the secret sin, it shouldn't be teaching. If there's iniquity, it should be into teaching. If there's hypocrisy, it shouldn't be leading other people. And, uh, you know, we ought to be faithful. In days gone by, we used to be that faithful because we knew that if we are sinning in secret, and then we're preaching in the public, we knew it will increase our condemnation. And so I've asked, you know, in the past, uh, brothers want to, wanted to have a retreat. And then I'll give messages out. And the, you know, brother will approach me and say, I'm sorry, I cannot preach at this time. I'm still battling with something. And I need to resolve that before I preach. And I will say, what's that? And it will be, it will be something, you know, there is uh, honesty broken down somewhere. And there is holiness broken down somewhere. And there is purity broken down somewhere. And they realize that. And they would say, I cannot do this at this time because of this kind of blemish and bad thing in my life. But you know, there are people that keep on teaching and keep on leading and keep on doing whatever. They're fighting with their wives at home. They keep on preaching. They, they keep on nagging their husbands at home. They keep on preaching. And they keep on being cruel and wicked to their children. They keep on preaching. And they are kind of naughty and evil and terrible, oppressive uh, to people in their community. And they keep on preaching. And they owe oh, this one and that one. And they keep on preaching. David said, no, restore to me the joy of thy salvation. And uphold me with thy free spirit. Then, and then only, will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Sinners shall be converted unto thee. Why do we preach and there's no conversion? Why do we preach and there's no conviction? Why do we preach and there's no bringing anyone to the Lord? Because we have made preaching isolated from personal purity. We have taken the title preacher as something that is of eternal security. Once a preacher, always a preacher. Once a teacher, always a teacher. And we have not taken care of the life of a real preacher. We live the ordinary life and want to preach the extraordinary message. The Lord is telling us that he takes purity, he takes holiness as purity in the life of anyone that professes to be a child of God. I pray you'll take holiness as priority, purity as priority, righteousness as priority. Uh, I want an amen that shows you accept. Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 13. Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 13. Habakkuk is in the, it's near the end of the Old Testament. So if you keep on opening uh, near the edge, you'll get it. And it's after uh, Nahum. I don't know if that helps. Habakkuk chapter 1, the first part of verse 13. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold iniquity, and canst not look on evil. Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and canst not look on iniquity. You see, if you are preaching, and there is iniquity or evil in your life, you are evangelizing, you know? there's iniquity and evil in your life, 
got a superior eyes that will behold iniquity, all the preaching, all the praying, all the perspiration matters not to God because he takes purity as priority. He tells us in Psalm 24. Psalm 24. I'm reading from verses 3 and 4. Psalm 24. We're reading from verses 3 and 4. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place? He that has clean hands. You realize this is a psalm of David. And David is asking the question, Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Or who shall stand in his holy place. And the answer came, David, you know what? Those who are going to ascend to the hill of the Lord, and those who are going to be with the Lord forever, must have clean hands. David, do you understand? Yes, I do. What do you understand? David, do you understand? When you hold another person's wife to derive marital joy, experience of marital pleasure. Do you know that your hands are not clean? Yes, I know. Do you know that when you take God's property and you take that property to walk against God, do you know your hands are not pure? Do you know, David, when you shed the blood of the innocent, you are not on the battlefield Somebody else has gone to the battlefield defending the glory of God and you have messed up with his wife. And then you call him and you use your hand to write a letter that they should get rid of this man as quickly as possible to cover your sin. David, do you understand? That makes your hand unclean. I now understand when you use your hand to do anything, anything sinful, even though it is healing, even though the people you are doing it to may not realize that you are the one doing it, you are not preparing yourself for heaven. You should go back to Calvary and should tell the Lord, your hands are not clean, your heart is not clean, your mind is not clean, your action is not clean. He that has clean hands and a pure heart, it goes beyond the surface. I do not steal. I have clean hands. I do not touch another person's wife. I have clean hands. I do not touch and defile somebody's daughter, somebody's husband, somebody's boy. I have clean hands. It goes beyond that. Your heart must be pure. And a pure heart who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully. That's what it takes. We're looking at Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, reading from verse 6. Matthew chapter 5, we're reading from verse 6. In Matthew chapter 5, here we're reading from verse 6. It says, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst at a righteousness, for they shall be filled. Verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart. There are Pharisees who appear pure outwardly. There are Sadducees who appear righteous outwardly. That's not it. That's not it. There are those who have not been cleansed, who have not been washed by the blood of the Lamb, who appear righteous morally. But the people whose hearts have been purified and purged, made holy, and sanctified. That's the priority of the Lord. And that should be the priority of every child of God who is thinking about having fellowship with God here on earth and fellowship with God in heaven. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I pray you will see God. I pray you will see God. Look at verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, 
when your heart is pure, you don't want anybody to suffer. You don't want anybody in conflict. You don't want anybody fighting. You don't want anybody in strife. You don't want to provoke anybody uh, to fight you. I'm looking for somebody to fight me. I'm looking for somebody to shout on me. I'm looking for somebody to bully me. I'm looking for somebody to, you know, get us in the field and get us in the open. And we're going to fight. Looks like there's nobody wanting to fight. Okay, if they don't want to fight, I'll provoke them. A child of God who is really born again and is still keeping saved does not look for strife. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. The Lord will purify us. The Lord will purify all of us. He'll purify our heart. He'll purify our mind. He'll purify our soul. We'll not be looking for fight. We'll not be looking for strife. We'll not be looking for combat. We'll not be looking for fighting in Jesus' name. Our heart will be so pure, we're peaceful. Our heart will be so pure that we are easy to live with and easy to walk with. The Lord will make us pure in Jesus' name. I'm peaceful in Jesus' name. I'm passionate for peace in Jesus' name. And the Lord will make us purity lovers in Jesus' name. Look at Acts chapter 15. I'm reading from verse 9. Acts chapter 15, verse 9. And put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. Purifying their hearts by faith. Uh, the, the apostle uh, Peter is talking about the house of Cornelius. You know what happened in the house of Cornelius? They received the Holy Ghost and they spoke in tongues. And Peter said here, speaking in tongues apart, that's not the greatest thing. You know? The people who want to speak in tongues, speak in tongues, speak in tongues. I've got the Holy Ghost. Do you know? Well, I didn't know that. I speak in tongues. Do you know? I didn't know that. Can I speak in tongues for you? That's not the priority. The priority is the purity of heart. And here the apostle Peter said, they received the same gift as we received. They had the same thing like we had. And he put no difference between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. I pray our hearts will be purified. No hypocrisy in our hearts. No bad habit in our lives. And nothing you know, that will not see the light of heaven, the light of day in our lives in Jesus' name. I'm looking at Titus chapter 2. We're reading from verse 11. Titus chapter 2. We're reading from verse 11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation has appeared to all men. All men. It's available for you, available for me, available for all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness, ungodliness will knock at your door, but will deny it, you'll say no. And worldly laws, worldly laws will knock at your door. But you will say no. But you live soberly, righteously, godly in this present world. Amen. In this present world, we live righteously. In this present world, we live godly. In this present world, every member of deeper life will know that this is the priority to live godly, to live righteously, and to live soberly, looking for, looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Look at this, look at this. Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from... Tell me. That he might redeem you from... That he might redeem all members of deeper life from that he might redeem all workers in deeper life from that he might redeem all the preachers of deeper life from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people. Think about that. There, there were days, days gone by when people in society saw deeper life. As peculiar, 
our character different, our lifestyle distinct, our approach to everything that speaks of the Bible holy, and our dressing, our appearance, everything totally different. And when you saw a deeper life member, you can tell you have deeper life, aren't you? You say, yes. How do you know? I know deeper life people everywhere. When they talk, when they stand, when they behave, when they act, whatever they did, they were peculiar. Whenever they are at their marriage ceremony, wedding, you know, all the people attending would say, see them. They're so sober. And they don't have all these extras, extraneous things, peculiar. And when they have children, you know, the way they, you know, do the naming ceremony, peculiar. So humble. And there's not, no money to waste any la their lifestyle. Everything they do, they're always sincere. They are always honest. If you give them work to do, if they cannot do it, they'll say, I'm sorry, I cannot do that. That's not my profession. Look for another professional person. They are not people that will cheat you. They are peculiar. And that's what the Lord wants. That's the priority of the Lord. Anything we do, anywhere we are, we are honest, we are truthful. We're transparent because he says he gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Zealous of good works. That's what the Lord has called us to. That's how we're going to continue to live. We will not let down the standard, the priority of our life, and the priority of our behavior and the priority of our preaching, and the priority of our work, and the priority of whatever we do will be purity in Jesus' name. We're looking at Second Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2, I'm reading here from verse 21. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 21. If a man therefore purge himself from this, if a person will take it as the priority of his life, the priority of his profession, the priority of his Christian testimony, and the priority of his Christian work, and the priority of his Christian labor, if a man therefore purge himself. Think about that. And there are people that try to purge other people. They try to school other people. They try to cleanse other people. They try to put other people in shape. They try to make other people orderly, but they themselves are disorderly. They themselves are impure. If I concentrate on myself, if you concentrate on yourself, in no time at all, we'll all be purged and pure. And we'll have a glorious church, not having wrinkle or spot. But if you try to make me cleaner, and you cannot do it effectively. And he tries to make her cleaner, and he cannot do it effectively. And she tries to make him cleaner, and she cannot do it effectively. We'll be in a mess, in confusion, and we'll be in conflict. But if a man will concentrate on himself, if a woman will concentrate on herself, if a man therefore purge himself from these, it shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Flee also youthful lost. Don't just stay there and allow sin to overcome you. Flee also youthful laws. Don't just stay there and be, you know, soaking in all those defiling thoughts and defiling feelings. Flee also youthful laws and follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, or them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. I pray the Lord will keep us pure. The Lord will keep you pure. The Lord will keep every one of us pure in Jesus' name. Purity will not annoy you. Purity will interest you. 
Purity will draw you closer. And when you see purity, you will rush at it and you want to be pure in Jesus' name. The priority of purity with our new master. Point number three now. The personality and the profitability of a new minister. The personality and the profitability of a new minister. Who is a new minister? Well, somebody who is new through and through. He is new in his understanding. He is new in his conception. He is new in his forthrightness. He is new every way. There is uh, no old habit, old lifestyle, old behavior. We're told in Second Corinthians chapter three, verse six. Second Corinthians chapter three, verse six. Who also has made us able ministers of the New Testament? Able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. They are not people who only abide by the letter. They go by the Spirit of the Word, and they are made new ministers. In Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4, I read from verse 23 and verse 24. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. What your mind thinks, what your mind dwells on, what your mind meditates on, everything is new. The old life would like to come back into your thoughts, into your mind, into your thinking. But you shield yourself from them and you are renewed by the cleansing of the blood of the Lamb. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that she put on the new man. Which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. There is no pretense in righteousness. There is no pretense in holiness. Everything is according to the word of God. A new minister, a new man, a new mind. In Romans chapter 6, Romans chapter 6, reading from verse 4. Romans chapter 6, verse 4. Therefore, we're buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Does the Lord desire that our lifestyle will be new? Our behavior will be new. Our character will be new. Our disposition will be new will be new, everything totally renewed. The Lord is able, the Lord will do it. In us, in you, in the whole church, the Lord will confirm that in Jesus' name. Ezekiel chapter 36, Ezekiel chapter 36, verse 26, a new heart also will I give you. How can God make a promise and not fulfill the promise? How can we read about the promise and never go to God in prayer for the fulfillment of the promise? How can God make a promise and we never think of the possibility of God fulfilling what he said he will do? He said he will do it, he will do it for everyone. A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. A new spirit he will put within us. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. God knows and recognizes what a stony heart is. What's a stony heart? A stubborn will. What's a stony heart? 
a rebellious mindset. What's a stony heart? An habitually disobedient disposition. But God says he'll take away the stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you an heart of flesh. Somebody say amen. Look at verse 37. Thus says the Lord God, I will yet for this be inquired of. He wants us to pray. He wants us to seek. He wants us to ask. He wants us to demand by faith. I will yet for this be inquired of by the house of Israel to do it for them. I will increase them with men like flock. Amen. We're looking at Hebrews, Hebrews chapter, chapter 8. In Hebrews chapter 8, we're reading from verse 10. Hebrews chapter 8, reading from verse 10. He said, for this is the covenant that I will make of the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their mind. That's what God wants to do. There will be no wall of partition to hinder him from doing it in your life in Jesus' name. He will do it for everyone. He will do it for every member of the family. He'll do it for the whole flock. He'll do it for his church in Jesus' name. That's what he delights to do. That's what he enjoys to do. And if he is not allowed to do this, he is not happy doing any other thing. This that he does is what can take us to heaven. All the other things, oh Lord, do this, oh Lord, do this, oh Lord, do this. All those things may be material things, and they may be earthly things, and they don't take anybody to heaven. But this is what takes us to heaven, and it delights to do this. I will put my laws into their mind, and write it in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. Look at verse 13. In verse 13, in that he says a new commandment, a new commandment, a new commandment. He has made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxes old is ready to vanish away. He'll give us that new mind. And he'll give us a new conscience. Somebody help me shout a new conscience. I didn't say just say it. I said shout it. A new conscience. You see, the old conscience is seared as with a hot iron. The old conscience can see you, you know, you are stretching your foot because you are having pain there. And the old conscience will march on that foot without even batting an eye and will start blinking. And if you say, oh, something has gone wrong, I, I feel the pain, he look at you and smile because it takes joy. The old seared conscience takes joy in doing evil, but a new conscience takes joy in, I'm sorry about that, I didn't know that to hurt you. They make restitution, they apologize, and they turn over a new life, and they turn over to the point they don't want to do that anymore. That's the new conscience. We're told in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 24, Acts Chapter 24, we're reading from verse 16. Here is new conscience now. And herein do I exercise myself to have, how often? I said how often? Uh-huh, I catch some of you, you have not opened your Bible. You're looking at my face as if the Bible verse is on my face. What a chapter is this? And what verse is this? And what book of the Bible? Acts chapter 24, verse 16. Open your Bible. And herein do I exercise myself to have, how often? Always a conscious voyage of offense toward God and toward men. Toward God, to have a clear conscience, a clean conscience. God who can see everything. 
God who knows the motive behind every action. God who can see every action and weigh the action. We keep our conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. Men who feel uh, the pain of our action or they feel the pleasure of our action. We have good, good conscience to them. Also look at uh, Second Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter 5, I'm reading from verse 17. Second Corinthians chapter 5, we're reading from verse 17. It says in verse 17, Therefore, if any man, if any member, if any minister, if any worker, Therefore, if any child, therefore, if any worker, therefore, if any servant of God be in Christ, he is a new creature. Anyone who claims to be a man of God, he must be a new creature. Anyone who claims to be a worker for God, he must be a new creature. Anyone who claims to have faith in Christ must be a new creature. Anyone that claims that he is Mr. Calvary and the blood of the Lamb has washed him and cleansed him must be a new creature. And it doesn't matter if he's a member of Deeper Life, he's a member of another church. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Somebody say good amen. amen. Now check up in your life. I check up in my life. What are some old things I used to do? I do no more. Can I find anything like that? Check up in your life. What are the old things you used to do? Old things you used to say. Old life you used to live. Old attitude you used to have. Old anger you used to manifest. Old provocation you used to manifest. Old hatred you used to have. Old laziness you used to have. And you can say by the grace of God you don't have them now. What are the old lies you used to tell? And you can say by the grace of God I tell no lies anymore. If any man, if any minister, if any worker, if any leader, be in Christ is a new creature. Old things are passed away. And behold, tell me the rest. And behold, tell me aloud. And behold, tell me with conviction. All things are become new. I pray that God will see that all things are become new. I pray that the angels will see all things have become new. I pray that heaven will see all things have become new in all of our lives in Jesus' name. We're coming to Isaiah chapter 41. Isaiah chapter 41. Isaiah chapter 41. I'm reading here from verse 15. Isaiah chapter 41, let me back up to verse 10. But I'm really going for verse 15, but let's back up to verse 10. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. That's old, amen now. Fear not, fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. The things you used to fear you could not do, the Lord is saying this new year, it will help you. And the things you need to, you need to you used to, you know, shrink back. How can I do that? How can I face that? How can I go for that? Because you felt your strength was small. The Lord says, Yea, I will strengthen thee. I will help you. I will uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. Behold, look at this one. This is for me. I said, This one is for me. 
you know, if you believe that, you're not going to be afraid of your responsibility of the work of the Lord, of what the Lord has committed into your hand. I believe. I believe. Behold, all they that were incensed against thee shall be ashamed and confounded. They shall be as nothing. Uh, you know, there are people that fear nothing. They fear Mr. Nothing. They fear Mrs. Nothing. They fear so and so. And the Lord said, go ahead, keep on walking and keep on living. All the people that are incensed against you, I'll make them Mr. Nothing and Mrs. Nothing. You will not fear nothing. You'll not fear Mr. Nothing. You'll not fear Mrs. Nothing. And they that strive against thee shall perish. They that strive against thee shall perish. Mm, somebody said, I don't understand. I understand. Can I tell you what I understand? I said, can I tell you what I understand? Pharaoh striving against Moses, the man of God, perished. The chariots of Egypt striving against Moses, the man of God, perished. The Canaanites fighting against Joshua, saying he will not get here, he will not get there. All those people perished. The Assyrians who were striving against uh, Jehoshaphat, they all perished. And all those who were striving against the men and the women raised up by God, they perished. Now you understand? And they that strive with thee shall perish. Amen. Amen. Thou shalt seek them like you seek for Pharaoh and for the Egyptians and shall not find them. Even them that contended with thee, they shall war against thee. They that war against thee shall be as... Mr. Nothing, Madam Nothing, Mrs. Nothing. They that war against thee shall be as nothing and as a thing of naught. For I, the Lord thy God, will hold thy right hand and say, saying unto thee, Fear not, I will help thee. He will help me. He will help me. Fear not, thou one Jacob. Are ye men of Israel? I will help you. Says the Lord and thy Redeemer, the Holy One of Israel. Here is the verse we're coming to now. Behold, I will make thee a new, sharp, threshing instrument having teeth. What are you? Why don't you stand up? The Lord is going to do something. A new tool. A new instrument. A new weapon. A new power. A new worker. With a new authority. With a new anointing. And with a new prospect. Behold, I will make thee a new sharp threshing instrument having teeth. And thou shalt thresh the mountains and beat them small and shall make the hills as chaff. No mountain will stand before you. No hill will stand before you. Thou shalt fan them and the wind shall carry them away. And the wild wind shall scatter them. And thou shalt rejoice in the Lord and shall glory in the Holy One of Israel. You become a new minister. You become a new man. You'll have a new life. It will give you a new heart. It will give you a new mind. It will implant in you a new conscience. You'll be a new creature. And you'll be a new weapon in the hand of the Almighty God. In Jesus' name. Every opposition will be leveled before you. Every mountain will be leveled before you. 
you will march forward in new strength. You'll be an achiever this new year in Jesus' name. The old is gone and the new is planted in your life. This year, you will not fail or falter. Why don't you open your mouth to the Lord and say, Lord, I accept that. Lord, I receive that. Lord, I hold on to that. Leave the old and cleave to the new master.